Okay, guys. Uh, <clears throat> a confidence interval is where we're 95%, because that's what you usually do, confident that the true mean for distribution lies between these points. That's what we're going to look at. Why is this important? Because if we're interested in something is different than our true mean, we could set something called critical values. And that's kind of what this is about. Um, no, I'm not going to restart my computer. So with stuff we're going to be doing, confidence intervals of the mean of a normal distribution with a known standard deviation um, and the different parts of that. If we don't know the standard deviation, um, confidence interval on uh, standard deviation and variance of a normal distribution, large sample confidence intervals for population, how we do this, what bootstrapping does with it. Uh, bootstrapping, because if you guys didn't watch it, is when you take a known distribution and values and you run simulations like tens of hundreds of thousands of times, you get a good idea of what we would expect when we don't have the ability to go out and do so, because uh, no one's got time for that. Uh, and we do tolerance and prediction intervals. And all this leads up to when next week or two, p-test and p-test on to actually, you know, what you do in statistics, because no one really does Bayesian, even though we're gonna talk about it. Well, yeah, we're doing the t-test like the t-test, so if you have two, we're, what it is is right now we're looking at one mean. Eventually we're gonna look at two means or mean against a standard. So is my, you know, what I'm testing for different than what I'm expecting? That's the whole point of statistics is you wanna know is what am I doing and is it going to be different than what I should have? And that's where this comes into play. Cause you don't have, cause whenever we get into it, you'll find like connecting letters reports and all kinds of individual tests, student t-tests. You don't actually have to do that. You can, cause it's easier, but this is where they came up with it. <clears throat> so if you have a confidence interval of a mean for an uh, interval on the form of, this is an LMU, but LMU is just lower and upper. Uh, and that's equal to one minus your alpha. So alpha, because they haven't really even talked about this. Alpha is something called a type one error. It is the chances of what you're getting. If it's, okay, alpha is, I want to make sure that I'm going to get 5% of my variance right, or wrong, possibly wrong. So, hard thing to type one result. And driving those. So an alpha is if I'm looking at 95% confidence interval, my alpha would be 0 0.05. So whatever that is, my normal distribution like this. I draw. Uh, uh, sorry. 0 0.025. 2.5% on each end. The alpha is a chance that we didn't see it when it's actually. <clears throat> so now we have a 5% chance of it, something being wrong, I think. Sorry, I, that's where dyslexia, there's like type one and type two, it's alpha and beta, and my dyslexic mind always gets it backwards. There is a table, you guys can get it right. Uh, I'm saying I may be wrong because I, I might be. But what it ends up being is whenever somebody asks you at a 5% confidence interval, that is alpha. Alpha is when they say, at a 10%, 5%, 1%, that's what they're talking about is your alpha level. And what you end up looking for with that one minus alpha is everything in between. That's what you're interested in. Um, so there's a probability of selecting a sample when, with the confidence interval contains a true value of mean. <clears throat> so when we construct that confidence interval, we're trying to find 
where within a five percent where it is sure a, there's a five percent chance that it is not in that area uh, so the endpoints are the bounds l and u called the lower and upper confidence intervals and called a confidence coefficient so they make this more annoying and difficult than it needs to be they really truly do what you need to calculate is actually Z alpha divided by two. Uh, you calculate that. That's what you calculate. And then once you have this part, you add the mean, you, you put the mean first one up, and the mean minus. So the variance, so basically what you do, get to do the z-score, 4 alpha divided by 2. So whatever you're, like you say, if we're looking at 95% confidence interval, we do 0.975. And you need our variance. And we need sample size. And we'll need our mean. You have all that, you can construct a 95% confidence interval pretty easily. Yeah, variance. Sorry, is it? My, yeah, mine always looks weird. I hate drawing them. I have problems with writing anyway, but I always like whiteboards, go figure. Remember, the square root of, or yeah. <coughs> so if we have 10 measurements of, name on the board, why don't you get your stuff in? We have 10 different energy impacts of a steel cut at 60 degrees Celsius. At the following degrees, the energy impact or impact energy is distributed with at uh, one joule, just a standard of variance, 95% uh, confidence interval for the mean, and we calculate it. So in this case, we have a 90, <coughs> okay. Reality, what you're going to end up doing is you're going to find the following So if you find Sorry, I'll give it a minute. Make sure everything's right. Oh. Point zero one divided by two point. Oh, yeah, point nine. If you take whatever's left, we're looking at a point oh one. For alpha. So what you do is 1 minus 0.99 is equal to 0 0.01. That's divided by 2. 0 0.05. So looking at 0.995. And this is 0.975. And 0 0.0001 minus 0.999 to 1. Over to 0.9995. So save yourself time. Write this on a little table somewhere. Because what you can do, uh, 
is the value table. This is actually pops up in Google. Love. So on Google, it will tell you what the value is. So take those, write those down on the thing, and use them. So we're going to be for ninety five one hundred and sixty four five. Um, for the product, we have a one pound pizza. So on the first one, we have point one six four five. Sometimes we use that. The second one, one point nine three. We use that a lot. There's two point three three, and the last is two point five eight. <clears throat> Google is your friend. It's same as if you would have looked them up. So use it. So. Any other topic in the PowerPoint? 33.5. When I talked this back like 10 times a day, I had those memorized like within a week. So we have that 95% confidence interval. So we have a Z of a divided by two of. 1.96. We have a standard deviation given to us as where is it at? One. Is it really one? Or variance is one. And we have an n of one, two, three, four, five, six, ten. So 1.96 times one over square root of 10 is our value. So times 1.96, which is equal to 0 0.6198. So once you have that value, you just take your mean, which is 64.46, and add and subtract 0 0.6198. And that gives you your upper and lower 95% confidence. <coughs> so what that means is our true mean will fall the lead between no plus or minus the mean and that value. So it's 61. Plus 0.6198 Wait, I'm doing stuff wrong. Two digits. Eight, nine, seven, zero, five, sixty-five point zero seven nine eight. What's enough? Sixty-four point four six minus zero point six one nine eight two zero. Four eight sixty three point eight four hundred. So this is essentially you say your wiggle room. The and when you think about it, you can tell a lot about a distribution based on how big or small this number is based on your mean. This is something they don't really talk about. Um, <clears throat> so we can see how far our standard deviation moves and create an area where we're pretty sure the mean's going to be better. So if you want to find the number you should have, <coughs> we can have a sample size for specific error on means with unknown variance. So we have x bar as an estimate of our mean. Uh, we can do yeah, all that. Uh, and we're confident that the error is our mean, our sample mean versus our population mean. <coughs> we're not expect to exceed a specific amount E when the sample size is a specific number. <coughs> so the idea on this one is we're trying to find the sample size that fits with the error that we're okay with. Where does this come into play? 
Anybody following 538's politics? Or polls in general? Well, if you're okay with a 10 point, you know, poll estimation, I know a lot of people aren't, you can determine your sample size that you need given a specific error with this number. It's also very good for, I don't know, industrial applications when you want to be really certain but not spend a ton of money. Determining sample size using this is very useful. <coughs> it also lets you know how much you can slide, given what you have, how much you could slide, because if you have your number that you're already going to use, and you have your known error and variance, you could find out how specific you can get on your power, on your z-score, given all that information as well. Because remember, this is just a formula, and you can rewrite it however you want. So if you want to find a z-score that works best, given all your information, redo it. I mean, there's a lot of random math that's very simple that you can get from these formulas. <clears throat> so if you have a CVM test, um, determine how many specimens must be tested to ensure a 95% confidence interval for a mean of that steel cut at 60 degrees. So we have an error estimate of one half of the length for the uh, TI, so 0.5. So we have the 1.96 for the 95% confidence interval. We know our variance is one in 0.5. Plug those all in and we'll do what? 1.96 is like 0.9-ish squared. Did they do that math right? Well, let's double it. So yes, they did. 1.96, so that would be 3.8-ish squared near 15 or 16. Yes, that is correct. So you, would, it, in order to get a 95% confidence interval, you need 16 samples. So remember, whenever you do these, you cannot have 0.37 of a sample. If you have, okay, I don't know what the homework's going to say. In real life, you cannot have a partial sample. So in order to get if you get this number, remember to always round up no matter what. Um, not necessarily homework, because Wiley's going to tell you whatever in the world Wiley wants to tell you. But for real life applications, you round that the whole numbers because it's better safe than sorry. So, yeah, it kind of tells about since n must be an integer, it's 16. Always round up. Always, always, always. So if I'm just looking for a one-sided, I use alpha and not alpha divided by two. Same formula, except I'm just either doing a right-sided or left-sided. So I either add or subtract. Um, but the formula is the same. I just look for a one-sided tail alpha instead of alpha divided by two. So on this, I look up one. I look for the bigger terms because I'm looking only at one side of terms. So why in the world would I do this? Anybody have any practical reasons why you would only do a one-sided tail? So who, anybody going to a, uh, chip, going to go work for a chip manufacturer? What's the you know? Do you have a minimum? Number of like uh, flops or inform or uh, what was it? Not flops. What's the word I'm looking for? Instruction per seconds. Millions of instructions per seconds. You have a minimum you have to meet, right? You have a maximum. One sided test. I need to be over a minimum. If you're dealing with environmental issues, you have a maximum. No one cares if you have too little lead in your water. Like if you have too much. One-sided tests are useful when you are dealing with extrema. When I'm dealing with, I can't have too much, I can't have too little in my sample. If you're dealing with manufacturing, you can only have so many defects before you have to tear it out. 
before you have to scrap it, yeah, before you have to stop a lot. The minimum number or maximum number in that case. So because there's an example, there's always an example. So the sample, the same uh, data, they are like the steel one today, uh, are used to construct a lower one-sided 95% confidence interval for the mean impact energy. So we still have the mean, the variance of one and the N of 10. Second easiest problem I've ever seen with these. The other one had a, a number of like 16. Um, so our lower would be at alpha minus, or Z of alpha, which is 1.64 over one over square root of 10, <clears throat> would give us a 63.94. If you're going to create a spreadsheet for these, for your homework, and I would not blame you, what you could do is create populate the list this way so you have them to call upon. So that whenever you do the calculations and you can do it for everything, it would just pop up with given your mean, your standard deviation, and your number. Because you never know what they're going to ask. And if you just put in three numbers and get all possible answers, better off. <coughs> so for the online people, I basically made a quick little three by two way table of Z alpha, Z alpha divided by two with 95, 99, and 99.9%. You fill it with all the known values in those parts so that you could create a quick Excel spreadsheet. I might actually do that someday if I have time, make a quick video on that. So <clears throat> if we have a large sample confidence interval from you, uh, when n is large, then the quantity is equal to x bar over minus our mean over big S divided by square root of n. Uh, it has approximate standard normal distribution, so we end up using s over square root of n. Basically, it, you can do the same thing. It comes down to you do the same thing. Um, like I like you said, there's like six or seven formulas. It's not. It's the same formula. It's the same thing. It's just under the idea we have done enough large sample size to know that our standard deviation, and it's the law of large numbers. If we get a large enough population, we assume a normal uh, distribution. We assume everything is going to be the same. So, mercury contamination. You have 53 Florida lakes and mercury concentrations from muscle tissues was measured in part per million. Uh, so yeah, don't write all this data down. So the mercury concentration values were given as follows. And they want us to find a 95% confidence interval for the mean. So uh, to do this, we would have to know where well, we have 53 for n. <coughs> we would have to find the standard deviation and the mean, and that's it. So since we have a big number, we have the assumption of normality is not necessarily to use the equation. Uh, so we have n of 53. They've calculated the mean for us at 52.5 and the variance at 0.3586. Uh, you just plug it in once again and you create it. Once you, uh, once this is all the say, say the same thing. So what that means is <coughs> given, assuming this is normal, the normal or sorry, normally distributed. So this is both industrial and non-industrial sites, the true mean of mercury contamination is between 0.4311 and 0.6189. So what does this mean in real life? So do you care about too little of mercury contamination? If you work for a plant, do you care about too much? So what you do is when you have your, your biologist who's working for the, for the plant, go out and test your local, for it, if you go above that upper, you need to do something before the EPA comes. That's what that means. <clears throat> Ideally, what you would 
probably do if you're working I, and I would highly recommend it if you actually work as a an environmental engineer create a 90 percent because if this is what they're going to test at for the EPA at a 95 percent you want to be at a 90 percent so that you could start doing remediation before they come because if you can get it before even if it's over by the time they come you've already started it and the EPA likes not having to do paperwork because I have a friend who worked for the Illinois EPA. They don't like doing paperwork. And if you're trying to get it fixed, they're less likely to do it. Pro tip. But I don't know if anyone's in, gonna be an environmental. What if you do? Help save you some headache. Um, <clears throat> so largest uh, sample approximate confidence intervals are pretty much the same thing. Except at this point, when you get big enough and they just assume the variance. So as you get like hundreds of thousands, hundreds to thousands, it just, it, the variance itself is what you end up adding and subtracting times your confidence interval. So P distribution, pretty much the same thing. Uh, so if we have a random sample of variables from a normal distribution with an unknown mean, so we don't know the mean and we don't know the variance, the random variable is T equals X bar minus the mean over standard or the population standard uh, population variance, sorry, divided by the square root of M. <coughs> The only difference is we go off a different table. Instead of a Z table, we go off a T table. Um, let me pull one up. What that means, T table. I don't know why I've been saying what that means. So not gonna lie, I was trying to help someone with this earlier on Discord. The T table on Wiley, is atrocious and it takes forever to get to. It's gonna sound really even worse. Dummies has a better T table. I don't know why. Uh, so this is a T table once I get it over. Oh, and of course it's gonna be blurry as I'll get out. So check has one, it's all the same thing. I just view the image. View image. So this is a T table. <coughs> so what you're doing, you're looking at the confidence interval that you're trying to calculate. So if it's 95, and remember one tail versus two tail, always important. Okay, so that alpha or the Z alpha is the alpha by two. What are you looking at? Sure. Then you have your degrees of freedom on the left. Your degrees of freedom is going to be n minus one. So you just go to whatever number you're looking for. So and that is the critical p value that you're looking for. So if we're doing degrees of freedom of five and a ninety-five percent, two point five seven one. So you, if you have want to meet the thresholds, that's fine. If you want to find the probability, what you can do, if you know your degrees of freedom and you know your t-score, you can go to how close you are to that probability. So if I had degrees of freedom of five and a t-score of 4.8, I'd say my probability is at least half a percent. Because the number goes above it, but I know for sure it's at 99.5. You can also look these up on Excel, uh, MATLAB, Python, or every program in the world. There's something where you can look up the t-value and find it. So yeah, don't, I know it's there. Theirs is so hard to read. This check has it, dummies has it. Like, these are all over the internet. These have been around since the 60s. Go and find it. Because there's, especially on the quiz, it's so hard to read. Oh, 
So if you don't have that variance, this basically it's the same formula. You have the T alpha divided by two times N minus one, but times your degrees of freedom uh, times S over square root of N. So very similar. You instead of oh this is this whole part right here let me actually is just your t value at that n minus one degrees of freedom then you have s divided by square root of n so it's the same formula will be an f Fun formula. Like I said, same formula over and over again. And it's algebra. And there are time and, and I know they're gonna do it. <clears throat> They'll have questions where you have to basically rework. So because they do it, they always do it. Uh, I don't know why, but uh, so if you're going to create a spreadsheet for doing it, I would just do each iteration. So do one where you have an unknown x, an unknown t value, an unknown s, and an unknown, unknown n. If you do that, you can solve all of them just by putting in numbers. So we have the load at specimen failure as it follows for the for these in megapascals. And they want to construct a 95% confidence interval. We got a sample mean and a sample standard deviation at 3.55. And we know the n. And then I don't know why people don't really proofread these things and it's an image, I couldn't change it. Our degrees of freedom is n minus 21. So they could go on there and find the t at 0 0.025 for, point, for 21 is at 2.08. I would not recommend doing something like this for t values because that would be so annoying. Yes. This right here, t.025, that is our alpha divided by two or alpha, depending on if it's one or two. Then there's a comma and it's degrees of freedom. Um, <clears throat> and we're not even getting into annoying models where you start reducing degrees of freedom and all that. This is just normal. Then you plug it all into the equation. This is why I said it's kind of nice to just calculate this part right here separately before you do this. Because if you have that value, you can subtract and add. And you end up with 12.14 to 15.28, which means the failure, um, the true mean of the failure would be between 12.14 and 15.28 at a 95% confidence. So you can see we have a fairly large um, distribution between it, we have like three-ish points. Um, if we get, <coughs> sorry, a larger sample size, that should go down. So that's something you may want to consider if you're doing stuff in real life. Am I okay with how big my standard deviation, how big my 95% confidence interval is, or do I want it smaller? Because if you want it smaller, that means you have to sample more. If you want it, if it's too small, or you want something bigger, you need to sample less if you can get away with it. <coughs> Sometimes you can't. So the chi-squared distribution. This is where everybody who ever contacts me gets it wrong. Mostly, you guys don't have probably won't have to deal with chi-squared a whole lot. This is for categorical data. Um, so right now is like, is I doubt anyone does survey data but, or, or demographic data. What chi-squared is, is I want to see if the number I'm getting from specific things differs from what I should have. Uh, so this is given as chi-squared is equal to your degrees of freedom times S squared over your uh, u squared, or sorry, what is it? Sigma squared. I'm ugh, my brain today. 
Uh, so the probability function, yeah, yeah, whatever. You've seen that probability. It's uh, falls under normal distribution usually, uh, but you can kind of ignore that. This is what's kind of important. Um, and even this, they make more complicated than it has to be. So <clears throat> the confidence interval is equal to the top part of that. Let's see. So if you're doing a confidence interval, you have the top part, the n minus one degrees of freedom times your s squared over your chi squared alpha divided by two n minus one. So your chi squared degrees of freedom. One sided, the same thing. Um, so this, once again, since it's looking at demographic data, uh, it's looking at how far, it doesn't really care about your mean. There is no mean, like if I'm trying to calculate how many, you know, if I want to do a, a demographic test and take everyone's, what's a good one? Age. Age is a good one because that's a nice one to, you know, because nobody, nobody can really argue with. If I get your age information for the entire class between here and the other one and put that up against the universities, will there be a difference in the distribution of your age based on a specific category versus the rest of the university? That's what chi squared looks at. Is what I'm having here different than what I should have? And this is how we calculate confidence intervals in order to do it. <clears throat> it ends up happening as you end up with a chi squared test, which we'll, I don't know if we'll do, but if we do, much easier than dealing with fractions with those parts. One sided, same thing, except you just add or subtract one. Um, so for these, these are mostly different and it's kind of hard to see because right here you have alpha divided by two and for, for the lower and for the upper, it's one minus alpha divided by two. So you're literally going to the upper and lower half of your Z score to calculate it instead of doing plus or minus your mean because you don't have a mean on categorical data. You can't, you know, find the mean of age if I break it into categories. I can't find the mean of gender if I break it into categories, because it just doesn't work that way. And most of you brains have turned off because you never will work with categorical data. I'm aware of that. So you can use it, and if you do, you end up using a computer. But if you have a filing machine used to fill bottles of liquid detergent, if you choose 20 bottles, and the sample variance to fill a uh, volume is 0 0.0153 squared. Assume that a fill volume is approximately normal. The confidence bound would be, take the, so if we do 20 bottles, it'd be 19 times 0 0.0153 squared over our chi squared, which would be at this point 10.17117. So 19 times 0 0.0153 over that would be 0 0.0. You can kind of use it, but most people don't. This is mostly used for other things. <clears throat> so the confidence interval for the standard deviation can be obtained by taking the square root of both sides, giving you a 0.17. Um, so this is kind of you know how much you deviate on each side. Is that enough to worry about? I mean. Honestly, 0 0.0287 fluid ounces. Is that enough to have people calling you? That's that's what that I mean, that's what you would end up doing with in real life. Is this within the tolerance of what we can be considered, you know, 16 ounces? Or you know, but then again, think of it. It's different if it's like a 16 or 32 ounce bottle versus a one ounce bottle. If I'm doing one ounce and I'm losing three percent of it, I'll be a little miffed. Especially, I don't know if anybody's ever bought essential oils. Like my rose water or rose rose essence is like forty dollars a bottle. So you're telling me I lose three percent of forty dollars? I'd be annoyed. Context is everything. So, large sample confidence interval for population proportions. This is where you end up with proportions. So this is you know what percentage of people will vote for who. What percentage of people will choose McDonald's when they're really running behind? Survey data. 
what people will say they will do or not. <clears throat> so that's x minus n times p all over the square root of xp times 1 minus p. So you have basically your p hat minus your p. So what you expect to have minus what you actually have over basically your proportion and your 1 minus your proportion and n. It is actually fairly straightforward. Um, you end up with different amounts. And this, you can kind of calculate and look at it. Um, you can do stuff where you don't know proportion by, by, uh, on these, which is kind of interesting uh, because you can calculate for the worst case scenario. Um, so to construct those, you're talking about P of alpha divided by two, or sorry, negative Z alpha, or T alpha, T or Z, Z, negative Z alpha divided by two, and Z alpha divided by two on both ends, which are more or less equal to one minus your alpha, more or less. So what ends up happening after they do all the math is you just take your Z score times this proportion right here, or the bottom half of the proportion and add it and sub, or add and subtract from your population proportion. So if you say, I don't know, 20% of the people go to McDonald's when they're running behind and need to eat, and you take that plus and minus that, you know, how many people actually go versus one minus P. So if it's like 30 and then 70, 0.3 times 0.7 is 0.21, and you do 100 people, so 0 0.0021 square root plus or minus that 0.3. That's how you do it, even though they didn't give me an example. So on a binomial, same thing. Literally the same exact thing, except you have the p hat, lower little p hat on that. Uh, so the, p, the little p hat is proportion to the observations in a random sample of size n that belongs to what you're looking at at approximately 100 times 1 minus alpha percentage <coughs> on the population proportion of that. Um, kind of the same thing. We have our known population. We have our sample. Uh, uh, pop, a proportion of observations from a random sample, portion of observations from, that is known. So that's the thing is we know one, we observe. Is what we observe different from what we know? And let's create a confidence interval for what we expect to see. So the wonderful people who go out and observe people like at drive throughs or on campuses or whatever, you just see there with like a little stop thing or even cars on the road. Anybody want to going to be like a highway engineer? You have to get all the information on cars traveling on roads to see if you should have it or not. And they put out either rumble strips or people with counters. This is what they're doing. This, somebody has figured out the confidence interval about how many cars should be on a road at any given time. And they're just trying to count to get the numbers for this. So they have a lower bound and an upper bound. Are they going to be within that or do they need to expand or do other work? on that section. The bump strips are so much more effective than people with counters, by the way. <clears throat> so a random sample of 85 autos, engines with crankshafts, bearings, can have a surface finish that's rougher than the specific specifications allow. So a 95% two-sided confidence interval for P. So the 95 is computed as a, from 8.1 as follows. So you have P minus your Z alpha 0 0.025, P hat one minus P over N, and then P plus the same thing. So we would do 10 divided by 85, which is the 0 0.12. The 95 is 1.96, 1 0.12 to 0 0.88, 85. Plug them all in, you get 0 0.0509 to 0 0.2243. So we expect to find, um, the sample size on so that is a fairly small that is a really small p hat of 0.12 uh so that gives us well not exactly big not exactly small big for its size but overall small 
So something they don't really talk about, and it's kind of bugging me as I'm going along, is something called uh, coefficient of variation. And if we finish, I'll talk about it because what they're doing really bugs me. And you can tell how bad something is with a simple metric, and it doesn't matter what you're comparing it against. It's all the same because it's unitless. So we'll talk about that when we're done. So how to find the sample size for a specific error on a binomial. Here's E alpha minus two over E squared times P times one minus P. When you do this, if you're going to use Excel, I would have something with P, one minus P, and then P times one minus P, because you will use that number over and over and over again. So you might as well just have it to call from one square, one of them instead of two, because then you would have fewer errors. Um, so sample size from the previous equation, we'll have a maximum P of proportion of 0.5. So this is the worst case scenario. If you are unsure of your proportion size, you specifically for finding the numbers, you choose 0.5 because that's going to give you the largest number here. And that would mean it would make the highest number that you need for your population size. So biggie, expected error. So so that's the error we're okay with, more or less. Uh, this is, once again, that 20.5. This is essentially a parabola. So this ends up going like this. All the way around. Like 0.99 and 0.25. It's the lowest chance. A sample size. You need to be the worst case scenario. I've had to math. I've done it before. I've actually sat down and did every probability from 0.1 to 0.99 times each other. And it's either the highest or lowest. I've had to remember. That's what happens in my lunch break when I teach that, is I think of random problems and try and solve them. Me. So, if we have a proportion of 0.12 as an initial estimate of p, we from the previous one, the expected sample size would be that 1.96, and if we're okay, so right here we have an error of 0.05. So if anybody, anybody besides me who's a follows polls too well, error in a poll is what we're talking about with these. How, how okay are we plus or minus from this? <laughs> so whenever they do the, the, the polling sample and it says it's a 3% or a 3% poll, it just means this number right here is 3% whenever they call. So you have the proportion of 0.25, which is the worst case scenario, I'm oh, sorry, oh, 0.12 times 0.88 times 1.96 over your error, quantity squared gives you 163. So in that case, you should have 163 samples. Uh, so if we don't care about the p-value, we don't care about the proportion, this changes to 0.25, we still have the 1.96 times 0 0.05 squared, put them together, 385. So if you don't care about the proportion or you don't know the proportion, you use that 0.25, it will give you the highest number possible, which is your fail safe. This is the number I have to have in order to be 100% sure. Uh, whenever they do like uh, polling for anything, for elections, they should use this. Um, some of them don't, be aware of that. If you play around with this number, you're going to get a different number of people polled, and from that, you're going to have different results. So, if we have, yeah, <clears throat> why do we do this? How, how many do we have to do? That's what it comes down to. How many samples do we have to pull? I don't know what they say here. The reality is how many samples do we have to pull? How much do we have to do to make sure that what we're doing is correct? That's what it comes down to. So one-sided confidence bounds of a binomial is P 
minus or P plus the Z alpha times that wonderful P minus one over P or one minus P all over N. Um, if you do it proportions, you just get used to having this value because it's there over and over. So same thing, except with the Z alpha instead of alpha divided by two. Proportion. Percent of success, percent of failure. I mean, it, it depends on, on what you're doing. It could be per, percent of people who like Sprite over Pepsi. Whatever a success or failure is in the given problem. The number of times I make it to, to here in under an hour and a half. I don't know. I wasn't, yeah. Uh, so, the most difficult thing is figuring out which formula to use. It's all the same formula, but which one specifically am I using? Um, which one am I doing? How much my sample size? Do I have a mean? Do I have a standard deviation? Do I have to use a sample? Do I use a population? Do I have a big enough number? All these things are kind of what you end up dealing with. <coughs> Um, this is what, anybody, how many people have taken physics? Hey, that's nice. I'm so used to no one answering. What is the first thing you do in a physics problem? Put down all your nums, right? That's what you do. Well, you cry. The first thing I tell everybody in, who's doing a physics, a physics like problem is to always write down your variables. Because 90% of the time you can find out what formula you're supposed to use based on what you have. Write down what you have, go from there. Even if you're doing a real world problem, if you write down what you have, you can see what you, not what you should do, but what you could do. Because sometimes they're not the same thing. Sometimes you should do something completely different. And if you're in school, contact a grad advisor. If you're in real life, contact your boss. And I can't do this because blah, quietly and see what they want. But that's up to them, not me. For us, for now, for homework, for this, write down what you have and see what you can do from it. There are some assumptions you could make. Remember, if specifically if you're on a Z, a Z distribution for mean and standard deviation, specifically for your standard deviation. If you assume a, assume a Z distribution with your mean, zero, what's your standard deviation? One. 1.96 to 1.96. It's just when you have known means and standard deviations that they change. Uh, eh. That just is a reference back to everything we've done. I don't like this slide. So bootstrapping. You end up doing, uh, yeah. Whenever you do bootstrapping, so bootstrapping, as you guys may or may not have heard it, is when you run different simulations of the data. When you have bootstrapping, the confidence intervals are going to be different because you're under the law of law, the, the law of large numbers. So the confidence interval is going to be alpha divided by the second, alpha divided by two if percentage, and one minus. So it's going to be completely different. So x bar minus one minus your alpha divided by two and x bar plus one or plus alpha divided by two. So if I'm looking at a 99.5, so I can add and subtract 0 0.0, so uh, x bar plus like 0 0.9 or 995, x bar or one x bar minus one minus 0.995. I take the number literally that I have over there, plug it in to either plus or one minus and use that. So a prediction interval on a single uh, future observation from a normal distribution is given by X minus the T uh, alpha divided by two based on your degrees of freedom times S square root of one over one plus N. I have never, I'm not gonna lie, 
This is literally my wheelhouse from my grad school. Real life, I never use this. Uh, prediction intervals, no. It's I. This is not something that I have ever used, and I run nothing but t-test, z-test, stuff like that. So, if it's something very specific, you may use it. I am not aware of it, but for me, this is something that I've never done. Formula is pretty straightforward. It's more of the same thing, plus or minus from your mean, given a specific formula that's been square rooted. So the prediction interval for that x n plus one will always be longer than the confidence interval. So prediction interval always going to be larger because look, if you look at it, it is going to be to give one plus one over n. That's going to be decent size times your variance and all that. It will be bigger. Um, so for this, we're going to talk about alloy adhesion. So the load failure for a sample size of 22 specimens was observed and found that the mean was 13.71 and the variance was 3.55. 95 confidence interval on the mean was 12.14 to 15.28. You plan to test a 23rd specimen. The 95% prediction interval on the load for failure specimen is, this is why you run it. What's my next one going to be more likely than not? So you'll X bar, minus your T alpha divided by two times your degrees of freedom, S one over one N. So 13.71 minus 2.08 times 3.55 times the square root of one over 22, ends up being 6.16, and that goes up to at the other end 21.26. So if you look at it, you have a really wide variance, and that kind of makes sense. If I'm 95% sure, I'm in between 12 and 15, then, and that's going to be my mean. But remember that if you're looking at one individual, that's not my mean. So the prediction of what I'm going to have is going to be larger than what I'm going to be more selective than not. But remember, this is a normal distribution. Just because that's where it most likely is going to be doesn't mean that's more where it's likely to be. It's probably going to be in that middle. It's 95% sure it's probably going to be in here if it's close to the true mean. But this is where I'm fairly certain it's going to be. So tolerance intervals are X bar minus KS or plus KS. Uh, so tolerance interval for capturing at least a, I really wish they'd stop giving me random Greek letters. What's the, what's the squiggly Y? Squiggly Y for the squiggly Y. I, I should probably know. I have a Greek teacher at my school. I'll ask him. Yeah, it's not. Is that Lambda? For Lambda. I was like, I got a Greek teacher. I could ask them, right? Uh, the values in a normal distribution with confidence interval is given by that, where K is our talents interval uh, found in the appendix. Yay. Uh, Forgiven for the 90, 95 and 99.9. And for those intervals, so what's S? Oh, S is S, duh, I'm awake. <sighs> so the load failure for N equals 22 specimens was observed and found that uh, S is equal to 3.55. The tolerance interval for that at 90% of the value of the population with a 95% confidence. So K for N for those values is 2.264. So this apparently is just needed to go look at this table to find the K. So the mean minus KS, mean plus KS gives us 13.71 minus 2.264 times 3.5. And then plus, which gives us between 5.67 and 21.74. So we can be 95% confident that at least 90% of the values of load of failure lie between these two. Uh, yeah. Whatever. So thus ends our lecture for today. <laughs>